Joe, I have to ask, mm -hmm. because people are going to want to ask. And it's, it's a little like Stephen King with everyone always talking to him about the stand, you know? Don't you want to talk about anything that's come since? Um, window of opportunity. Yeah. Because Ivan, you were there at that point. I was. So you would have to have memories of that shoot. We actually started on the show around the same time. Yeah. Basically the exact same time. Yeah, I remember actually they were interviewing uh, assistants. It was actually Michael Greenberg and, and uh, and Richard and Anderson, and I remember Paul and I were watching the you know people come by, and and uh, and a beautiful woman came in and interviewed for the for the part, and um, the part uh, for, for sorry for the uh, <laughs> for the job, and then this guy comes in, and uh, and then he ended up getting the uh, yeah. the job because yeah. I talked hockey with Rick. Mm. He spoke his language literally. All right. Mm. But window opportunity. Yeah. Um, was that a part of one of the uh, of the pitch that got you guys hired, you and you and Paul, or did that come later? Or was one? No, later? Paul and I, we sent in I think five pitches. Okay. And Scorched Earth was the one that 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 got us the the, the writing gig, and they said, well, if you do a good script, we're, we're going to hire you as uh, staff writers. And Robert Cooper uh, told us the story that. Uh, Brad and he were off to Hawaii for one of their like annual golf trips and they only had one hard copy of the script and so Brad was afraid to read it because he said if he read the script and it was terrible then it would ruin his entire golf trip so he said, <laughs> oh, read it while they were on the plane and then Rob finished it and Brad was like well he's like you can enjoy your, your, your trip and so you know based on on that script we got the gig and we ended up uh, one of the pitches that we had sent him was for what would turn out to be Window of Opportunity, which was a time loop episode, but it was a lot darker in the original premise. Really? And it was about a, uh, we, we discover a society that, that is facing some sort of like apocalypse, but they, they're a, they have a, a, a device that allows them to reboot time or basically, you know, go back 24 hours and, and they're constantly trying to fix the problem. And, uh, and, and Rob was like, uh, Rob Cooper was like, well, you know, maybe instead of like, maybe more about our, our characters and our characters are caught in the time loop and, you know, maybe it's something like this and something like that. And he was adding these elements. And after a while I was like, wait a minute, we're just doing Groundhog Day. He's like, yeah, exactly. You can mention. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry, but that just happens to be how I feel about it. What do you think? Just a question. It was a real learning experience, that episode for me, because, you know, it was one of those instances where you're taking a chestnut, the time loop episode, but, you know, you're making it unique to your characters and your world. And even though, you know, Run Lola Run had done it and, and Star Trek had done it and cause and effect and like other shows had done it. Community does it later. Yeah. We did it, and it was unique. It was just Rick and and and, and uh, sorry, uh, O'Neill and Teal'c, who are like the, the yeah, yes, exactly, or the, the fish out of water. Perfect. They're the ones. And it was a comedic episode, and it turned out to be like a fan favorite. So you know, it just goes to show that you know, if you can just take a, you can take an established idea, but just make it unique to your and, characters. And that's what I was going to say. Go put the, your own kind of stargate spin on it. Yeah, you, yeah. You, there was actually, I think, Rick especially kind of really got a lot of emotion through mm -hmm. In that last uh, scene. He, yeah, he, yeah. He, he sells it. Yeah. yeah, you know the significance of that character in terms mm -hmm. of uh, facing a situation like Malachi is facing. Yeah. If you could go back and do, go through this again, I lost my son. Yeah. You're not going to be able to reboot this yeah. and be able to survive. So just it, because it ran the gamut in terms mm -hmm. of yeah. the best kind of SG-1 story. And, yeah. and something that the fans, or probably diehard fans, do know, but maybe a lot of fans don't, is that a lot of the sequences, the bike riding and the pottery and the golfing through the, through the Stargate, were actually added later because this, the episode was running short. And so we needed time to fill the, the episode. And so we ended up scripting that and adding that at the last minute. But that, that show was a, a perfect example of what I think made, for me, as if I step away as a fan, mm -hmm. and I think for a lot of people, uh, successful too was the amount of humor that, that mm -hmm. had yeah. to infuse into that show. Because you, you, there's a different way. I mean, the movie originally was so much darker, 
Yeah. But and, and I think that was Rick's thing when he wanted mm. to come on the show, right? He said, uh, "Yeah, he's like, I, I can't play Kurt Russell." Yeah. But I, this, you know, I, I, I you know, if it's going to be funnier and everything else, and that sort of influenced the show. But it was there were so many times where there was just really yeah. funny. Yeah, that's one of the things I loved about SG One, especially, was the opportunity to do humor. And you do, you know, you know, we did episodes like Point of No Return or Wormhole Extreme, which was like a a great example, or Two Hundred where we were just totally off the wall. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, we could do like a lot more serious episodes, a lot more, you know, mythology laced episodes. Fifth race, you know, mm. Lost yeah. City. Mm -hmm. Some just cornerstones in my mind of the whole mm. of science fiction, mm -hmm. you know? And it's again, building mythology and feeding back on itself later on mm. until you kill the Asgard, which I'll never forget yeah. you guys for. And that, I mean, that's, <laughs> what's, that's what's so great about Window of Opportunity, because even though it doesn't necessarily kick the story along mm -hmm. that much, you come out of it and you feel like you are more familiar with the characters. Yeah, you learn yeah. something about those characters mm -hmm. and how they operate, which is, I, I think, pretty impressive. And kind of what you tune in for, too, right? You can tune mm -hmm. in for, and Joe said it a million times, you can tune in for whatever the sort of uh, exciting episode is, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, it's about character and, and story and their development, and, and that's the thing who people um, uh, relate to and fans mm -hmm. relate to and you were talking about Eli and he was sort of that conduit to, for a lot of fans and so he was them yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's what you whatever the show is and I think Stargate's no different you tune in for that right? and I think it's interesting you know we talk about that developing characters with an episode with, with a time loop episode but you know in that situation O'Neill and Teal pertain a lot of that information yep. you you uh, there were a number of episodes where largely you know what we saw unhappened look at mm -hmm. that Mobius Mm -hmm. Which was like a beta of continuum, really. Yeah. Um, where the 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 events that we were exposed to, even though it, it allowed us a great story, mm -hmm. the the characters don't remember it. Right. So you run that risk of well, do we do we go ahead and create an awesome, you know, in this case, a two hour episode, mm -hmm. um, and uh, make it so that the characters don't remember what what came after? Mm -hmm. And you played with that with great comedic effect with the fish. You're right. You know? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Didn't that tape say there were no fish in your pond? Close enough. I, I actually, I had legitimately grew up with Stargate because I'm 33, so kind of it caught me at just the right time. Mm -hmm. And right. as you guys know, there's a huge Stargate audience in the UK. Yeah. So there's a couple people. I yeah. You know. And so I was lucky enough to kind of, I mean, SG1 came out. Was it? So I was 13, so it, it, I was... And that's a really good point that it was, it was, it came in the time before it was cool to be a nerd, yeah. right? I mean, and there's definitely been that renaissance, but there was that, I think it was almost like a place for people to, to gather, whether it was conventions or online or, and I, I mean, quickly, mm. I, I remember being like, wow, there was a, there was a big world but outside. You're in college at this point. Yeah, well, but in college is when I, in the first couple of seasons, but it's when I got there, sort of season four, that I realized... Yeah. Um, there's, there's a, and then as we carried on. But what you said about Europe uh, and, and, and the reach of Stargate, yeah. that always amazed me because, I mean, we always did well in North America. It's U.S. military for crying out yeah. loud, you know? Yeah, always did well. And that was great because we always get like postcards and letters from people serving. And, and I always found that was, you know, very, very touching. Uh, but at the end of the day, our cast could walk walk around streets of any u.s city and and you know fairly you know, go fairly under the radar with the exception of richard anderson but in europe i mean couldn't pull it off no i mean it, chris judge said he'd be walking down the streets of paris and people would be like running after him mr Thiel, mr Thiel. he told us this story him and yeah. carmen told yeah, us yeah, this yeah, story yeah. Mm -hmm. so. and also i mean i think the north america has been doing that kind of pop culture convention thing yeah. for a lot longer yeah um, and so I think in the UK and probably in Europe, the rest of Europe as well, uh, it took us a lot longer to kind of come out of the nerd closet and mm -hmm. you know, kind of celebrate it. Mm -hmm. But I think in a way, kind of bottling that up, it makes your kind of fandom even more intense. Yeah. But, and then there's one thing about, so you enjoy it, you go to conventions. The stories that you would hear how Amanda Tapping and her character influenced like young women to be mm. like, scientists and, yeah. and how uh, Daniel Jackson's character influenced people to be, you know, to, to go into that world. It, it was it, like I was always, like, yeah. you would never, you would always be amazed at those stories because yeah. it, they were real. And it's like you would see somebody at a convention and they would get up and be like, 
you're the reason I am a scientist today. Over we're impacting AI. people's lives. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. For the better. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. It's not like you're creating a world that's, <laughs> yeah. that's yeah. dark. Because a lot of sci-fi now yeah. is dark. Yeah. This one ain't. What happened? Do you still possess the knowledge of the ancients? Nope. Don't remember a thing. But you know that meaning of life stuff? I think we're gonna be all right. The fact that it it's a show that short, it, it got serious, but generally yeah. it just wanted to have fun. You. Well, it's, and that's way more universal than trying to, it, uh, to get gritty. It's funny because, I mean, I think that's what really appealed to the fans, the characters. And I've always been a firm believer that humor is such a shortcut to allowing fans to connect with characters. And that's what SG-1 had a lot of and SGA had a lot of. And, and Star Universe to a certain degree. But I just find now the emphasis is on dark. Dark sci-fi. Reflecting our society. Yeah. Um, but, but you can, you can, you don't like. You can still have those episodes and those moments and those, you know, that those heroic moments and those dark moments. But well, when you're dealing with a show that's an ensemble or you're dealing with a show that's Stargate, like you have to come back to those humor. Yeah, but, but my point is now, the focus is on that darker programming, and it's great and it's it's fine. But I think the decision makers really overlook the appeal of fun sci-fi. And you tried to do that with Dark Matter. To produce right. it, yes, it and, and it was successful. It's escapism. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, why I, set I, something in now? I, you know, that's why. Like, yeah. Now would be a perfect time for a new Stargate series. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, a fun Stargate well, series. Well, uh, yeah. Funny. Yeah. <laughs> and I think you can still, to, to amend what I just said, you know, you can still set it in the now without being yeah. as dark as now. Yeah. You know, Sam is still meeting extraterrestrials, but her, her father is still still like, dealing with lymphoma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it was things like that where, you know what, I can I can relate to that. Yeah, Not the alien part, but you know. Read still, comics and watch sci-fi because I want to be transported to a different time or a different world. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't want kind of modern day yeah. worries kind of yeah getting into that. I'm sure that, you can kind of nod to it, but mm -hmm. oh, absolutely. And yeah. there's not, I don't know if there's, in sci-fi, if there's a better story engine, that gate, than... Hmm. than Every time you yeah, step through, you're off on another yeah, world, and another adventure. Yeah. Yeah. And the amount of, what was always interesting for me, sort of standing back and watching you guys do your work, was how you could play with the gate and how things would go wrong. Those are mm -hmm. some of my favorite moments. When the when gate things, yeah. when the, yeah, something goes wrong yeah. with the gate and you're those, in those, those, yeah. those damn solar flares. <laughs> yeah. so you yeah. just get it right. right. Yeah.